before, and he's here this morning. I'm just going to give you a small sketch of his bio. Minister Tony Adams, BTH degree, Bachelor of Theology. He's a product of Oakland, California, and a platinum pioneer of hip hop music. And don't uh, talk too much about that, because we all came from some of that. Some of us came from the blues. Minister Adams started on the streets of Oakland with a rapper, friends, and this was in 1980. Mr. Anthony Tony Adams, he was called by God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in January 2006. He is a member of the Mount Calvary Baptist Church under the leadership of Dr. Cleveland Lee, Jr., a staff minister over the Evangelism and Discipleship Division. He was a part, my friend, of the continuance of 18 missionaries who ministered in Ghana, West Africa, in March 2011, helped to build and, my friends, uh, what they call these water tanks and water hoses and water pipes, and that the people in those countries could get clean water. What a blessing from God. He did those wells in the villages. Locally, the team has formed, the, my friends, the Beyond the 14 Walls of Street Evangelism team that all this has to do with our guests that goes out monthly, shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. The team spends most of the year ministering to those who live on the freeways and bridges. Minister Adams was also used by God to set up medical and dental care for those living under the freeway and in homeless camps as doctors and nurses regularly came out and set up my friends' tents to help them and assist them with medical help. He and his team also gives away over 600 backpacks, listen carefully, annually and over 6,000 toys during the holiday season. He's not only at, as a, at the desk as a staff minister, he's doing what the disciples did. He's going outside where they won't come inside. Let us receive him by the response of. Amen. God bless you, Dr. Pastor Adam. It's in your hand and the Spirit is guiding. I asked him, did he sing? Thank you. God bless you. Are you at home? I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. I will bless, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let me try it again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, let me try it again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast unto the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify. Is there anyone that can magnify? Oh, magnify. I know it's early in the morning, but somebody gonna catch this. Oh, magnify. Can anybody magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together? I thank God this morning. I am elephant excited 
hippo happy and orangutan overjoyed just to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I thank God for Jesus Christ who saved my life and turn my life upside down to the glory of God. And let me honor the set man of this house in the person of none other than Dr. Ephraim Williams. Let's give God some praise for the angel of this house. And we thank God for all of you, for the ministers that are present this morning. We thank God to his glory. Let me thank God for Dr. Claiborne Lee Jr. who gave birth to me some 15 years ago in the ministry. And I thank God for my pastor for allowing this to happen. And we're just hum humbled and honored to be in this house this morning. I do see a few members of the Mount Calvary Church and the evangelism team here today. Can you please stand? I brought some amens with me and we just thank God we just thank God for his glory. Amen, amen, amen. Bless the Lord. Uh, my two daughters are not present today. My baby girl is Michaela. She's 14, ninth grader at Jesse Bethel in Vallejo. And my oldest daughter, Brianna, is a second year undergrad at Cal Berkeley. And we give God glory. We give God glory. We thank God this morning. And let me introduce the love of my life. Uh, this coming August 21st, I will have been married 20 years to Sister Latoya Adams. Can you stand, baby? She is the shot caller of the house. If she ain't happy, nobody's happy. Amen. Come with me to Mark chapter 5. There is a word from the Lord today. We thank God for evangelism, for winning souls for the Savior. There is a word in Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20. It's a very rich word, and we won't be able to get through all of this in this preachment. But if you come back tonight, you'll learn more. When you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say oh my. Amen. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling amongst the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him, and always night and day, he was in the mountain and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of this man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Climb up to verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and who had legions, sitting and clothed in their right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from the region. 
And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home and evangelize. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and they all marveled. Before you take your seat by the power of the Holy Ghost, I just want to talk about when life comes to a dead place. You may be seated in the Lord's divine Holy Ghost presence. When life comes to a dead place, Jesus comes to a graveyard. What happens when life comes to a dead place? Let us pray. Father, move me out the way, O oh God. God, you stand. I thank you this morning, God. The grass wither and the flower fades. But your word, O oh God, stands forever. God, move me with preaching power, God. Holy Ghost power, God. And we'll be careful right now to give you all the praise, glory, and honor. Amen. Anywhere there is no life, you must consider that place a dead place in the absence of spiritual life not just earthly life but spiritual life zoe life abundant life that can only come from the life giver jesus himself you must conclude that it's a dead place y'all gonna help me preach this morning a dead place is not just in a graveyard, but it could very well be in neighborhoods across this country, including Sacramento. A dead place is where children are being gunned down on the streets in communities all across this country. It's a dead place where brothers are killing brothers. When death and destruction destroys our communities. It's a dead place when our educational systems are in shambles, when school fundings have been decimated, when cutbacks have been catastrophic, and where big government would pass a tax bill that would literally kill our communities. It's a dead place when 45, I can't say his name, would rather build a wall and build Wall Street rather than tear down the walls of poverty in streets around this country. Too many of our brothers and sisters are dying in dead place. A dead place is where dreams have been shattered, where our people have been handcuffed and shackled, I'm in the text already, where our young people are strapped to a satanic society, where our kids are on the verge of suicide, where prisons have replaced colleges, where drugs have taken lives, where playgrounds have been closed down, where basketball courts have been replaced by a high body count of black folks in body bags. It's a dead place. A dead place is not just when you're a monk's corpse in a cemetery, but a dead place could very well be our young men in a corrupt court system. Many of our people are dwelling in tombs where life has been terminated, and whether you know it or not, our young people are crying out. <laughs> Let me suggest to you this morning, our people 
are alive in dead places, but they have no life. And where life is deficient, you could very well be alive, yet living in a dead place. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, God is calling the church to go out and help folks that are living in dead places. Jesus comes to a dead place. I'm in the text already. I feel all right. And where life is deficient is where evangelism begins. It's our business, the business of the church, to bring life to people who are in dead places crying out for help. It's called evangelism. And if the truth be told, there's no telling what could happen if we brought life to a dead place. God has commissioned us to go, to leave the pews, to leave the pulpit, and perch on the pavement to share our Prince of Peace. In fact, didn't he tell us to go in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission? He says, therefore, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them the things that I have commanded, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. God is with us whenever we go into dead places. Because he is the life. I'm talking about Zoe life. You've got to bring life to people who are living in dead places. He says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Here it is. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me make sure you understand my premise. As the Holy Ghost positions us, on the precipice of this paradigmatic, powerful passage. Just because a person has life does not mean that they have the life. You could be breathing, whoo, but you still don't have Jesus. God's grace and his mercy is what keeps the lungs functioning, but you gotta have the breath of life and his name is Jesus. I hope I don't jump out this pulpit this morning. Uh, here it is. You can be living a life that you consider full of life, but when you line it up with the word, it's lifeless. But it's really life in a dead place. Here it is. And that's what happens in this passage this morning. God brings life to a dead place. And all I'm trying to tell you this morning, if you want resurrection from life's rigor mortis, you must let the Redeemer into your dead situation. If you want demons to flee, if you want salvation, if you want peace, if you want joy, if you want love, just allow the life into your life when it comes into your dead place. And that's the story this morning. <laughs> Jesus comes to the other side. And whenever the Bible talks about the other side, he's talking about Gentile land. <laughs> he's talking about going into the neighborhood. And he shows up in a dead place. And somebody here under, sound of, under the sound of my voice needs life in your dead situation. Okay, let me try it here. Let me try this side. You need life in that dead relationship. Woo. You need life in your finances. You need life in your marriage. God is coming this morning to bring life to a dead place. And when you read Mark's gospel, Mark records the most miracles that Jesus did in the New Testament, in their action-packed, Mark writes the action-packed gospel, words in the King James like straightway. Woo! God does not hesitate to come into dead places. Many of us are saying, well, I don't go out and evangelize. Well, Jesus goes into 
a dead place. When we arrive in this passage, Jesus has shown up on the outside of this situation. He arrives on the outside of this graveyard in the Gadarenes and began to do what those who put this man inside these handcuffs could not do. Uh, I might preach this right now. Jesus pulls up in a boat and the text says he came to the other side or to Decapolis. This place in Greek literally means precipitate or headlong. In other words, watch this, it means without deliberation. When you study the etymology of this word Gadarenes in its original language, Jesus goes in without delay. He didn't need another prayer meeting. He didn't another, need another meeting. He went to this place because he knew lives had to be changed just like when he went in to Samaria. John chapter 4, here it is. Uh, he goes in and our Lord comes to this dead place and there was no deliberation because a life needed to be changed. It's high time we stop deliberating and calling meetings on things we need to change. This man was hurting and without deliberation, Jesus shows up. Can I preach this morning? The Messiah was doing maritime missionary work and he arrives at the door of this man's misery. This man runs and worships Jesus. Watch Jesus now. Here is living water coming off the water to bring water to a dry and thirsty place. Whew, that was good, Tony. Uh, <laughs> let, because every now and then, when, we in our, when we're in our own dead, dry, and doubtful place, when we are bound and shackled, when we are in a tangle up in trouble, whoo, I just need to let you know that Jesus will show up, but you gotta run, fall down, and worship him. Here it is. There are three things we see in the text this morning. The first thing that we see is that when life comes to a dead place, there's an immediacy of change. Whew, okay, let me, let me unpack that. There's an immediacy of change. I didn't say immediate change, but there's an immediacy of change. That word immediacy, I love words. I love to do word studies, the etymological root of words. And this word immediacy means the quality of the immediate. <laughs> Huh? You cannot send a dump truck to where a fire truck needs to go. Jesus had to come himself to this dead place. In other words, Jesus had to come this way because the change he needed in his life was so important that only the life himself had come to bring qualitative change. And when we go into communities, we're not going there to gossip, we're not going there to judge, we're going there to bring life to a dead place. I don't care what you look like, what you smell like, Jesus loves you and so does the church love you. And see, that's where we get it twisted because the church is not the building, woo. The church is the ecclesia, the called out body of believers. And when we go into the neighborhoods, we go to love on folks. We have adopted apartments in our neighborhood and we were there a couple of months ago and 55 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. 55 people gave their life to Jesus Christ because we just did not bring ourselves. We brought the life. Let me summarize here and walk and press my way because the text says, verse one through six, that's where I'm at. As soon as Jesus got out the boat, there was an immediacy of change. Okay, you missed it. You looking at the words. <laughs> I'm looking at the life. As soon as the church bus showed up. Woo! 
it triggered some change. Watch this. Jesus is on a boat. You're in your Lexus. Whew. You're on the church bus. And God wants to use you to affect change in hurting lives. As soon as the Lord showed up, this man with an unclean spirit came out from a dead place. There's an immediacy of change. When the life showed up, there was change. Okay, let me bring it down your block. When our fathers show back up at home, there'll be change in our son's life. When our young boys start pulling their pants up, as our mothers teach their daughter about the importance of being a respectful young lady, as soon as we get out the pews and hit the streets and tell folks about Jesus, there will be immediate change from the God of immediacy because Jesus is living out what he told us to do. Whew. Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. As soon as Jesus parked the boat, whoo, things start happening. <laughs> as soon as the boat pulls up, I mean as soon as the church bus pulls up, as soon as the evangelism team shows up at the battered women's shelter, at juvenile hall, at the penitentiaries, at the food pantry, at the, at the place where the ladies hang out, at the liquor stores where the prostitutes are, as soon as the deacons pray, as soon as Sunday school starts, people that are in dead places will meet the life. Mm. We've got to go beyond the four walls of the church. Jesus comes on water because he's living water, and he comes to bring life into this graveyard. Now, the text leads us to believe that this boy had been bound and shackled. Whew. Every time he was handcuffed, he went back to doing the same thing. It's called recidivism. Hmm. Huh? Y'all know that word? That means to go back to jail. Whew. Many of our men and our brothers are going back to jail because they don't have the life. They don't have anyone to show up in their dead place at that liquor store by that drug house to say, baby, Jesus loves you and I love you. And that's why they're going back because the church is not moving beyond the four walls. Now our prison ministry goes into the joint. Woo! But we rather work with our juvenile delinquents to keep them out the joint. You just can't have a prison ministry that goes into the penitentiaries to preach. The preaching begins at the middle school. Huh? Come on. Real prison ministry is advocacy. Woo! We want to stop our boys and girls from going in to prison. So we do prison ministry in middle school. I took recently nine boys up to San Quentin. I take them up, me and my team, and we go into San Quentin. And when we get to San Quentin, this dead place where it's full of life, we go in there and the first thing we see is death row. And these nine boys between the ages of 13 and 17, if they had Adam's apples, they would talk. Uh, you look at them and you see their faces. And when we take them into San Quentin, we partner them with lifers. And these lifers come out and pour into these boys' life. Then we take them up to the fifth tier in Badger Unit. And we lock them in a cell. And we tell them that you need Jesus. You need to respect your parents. You need to go to school and get your grades. We literally take them in. And then when we bring them out, we bend them over the tier because they could easily be thrown to their death over the tier. Our program has a 86% success rate because life takes them to woo, a dead place. Here it is. Not only 
is there an immediacy of change, but there is emergence of challenges. Watch this. Let me back up here. Uh, we cannot just keep inviting people to church, huh. though we should. <laughs> we need to love on people. When somebody walks in this church or any church, and I don't care if they got on baggy britches with a marijuana leaf on their t-shirt or a skirt up to their neck. Woo. We've got to love on our babies. And they may park in your parking stall. Don't get mad at them. Don't run them off. Let them know, hey baby, you can park there. Because we're not trying to fill churches. We're trying to fill heaven. Woo. Yeah, we're trying to fill heaven, Dr. Williams. When unchurched folks show up, they may not have on the Gucci wear like some of us. They might not have the Michael Kors bag, okay? But we've got to love on our people just like the master. Watch this. Jesus in this text, this is an evangelism text, and it shows Jesus power over the forces of evil. Woo. Jesus does an exorcism of this man. And a lot of our people have demons inside of them. And you got to call a demon a demon. Woo. Here it is. Jesus is out the box. And your evangelism ministry has to be out the box. It just can't be status quo. You can't hand somebody a sandwich and say, God bless you, I'll see you later. You have to find out what their felt needs are. And your ministry needs to help them with resume building. Woo. Would help them find a job. We have a job that helps felons get jobs. We have an opportunity for folks who were living in dead places to better their lives. And that's what the church is all about. This house of prayer. Woo. Many of us are praying, waiting on God, but God said it's already done. I don't know what you're waiting on. It's already done. <laughs> you're waiting on your prayer to be answered. But God says it's already done. Here it is. Jesus, I'm in verse 7 through 14, as my pastor would say, I'm just tiptoeing through the tulips of the text. This word immersion, second point is that there is an immersion of challenges. This word immersion means to sink, to take under, and to lay down. In this case, it means to drown. Many of our problems, many of our challenges, says the prophet Micah, God has cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. This man's problem, watch this, in the text, when you get a chance, read this again, is that after he got saved, whew, he still had demons. Whew, he still had problems. He still was on the low. He still didn't know how to pull his pants up. She still didn't know how to fix her skirt. She, he still had gold teeth in his mouth. Verse 7, he still needed to learn more about the master. Now, a psychologist would call this man manic depressive. Right, right. Ooh, ooh. Here it is. But Mark gives him a biblical diagnosis. Uh -huh. yes, sir. He was a demoniac. Yeah, yeah. And you got to stop playing with them demons. You've got to call it like you see it. Child, you got a demon in you. And I'm going to help you get that demon up out of you. But it won't happen until life comes to a dead place. Many of our children and, and young adults are being misdiagnosed by psychologists. They need a biblical diagnosis. My baby has demons inside of her. What demons? The man says, our name is Legion, and we are many. Watch this. 
What demons are, are in our boys? My name is Crips and Bloods. Woo. My name is Little Shotgun. Huh? My name is Little Pool Stick. God is moving in our young men's life. Every man in this place needs a young boy that they can mentor. Because when we take that junk and drown it in the sea of forgetfulness, God wants to bless their life. This brother comes out of a graveyard when he saw Jesus. How many people are coming out when they see you? When they see you, they don't come. But when they see the God in you, they come. We've got to bring God to every place we go. I opened up a rap concert with prayer. Woo. Lord Jesus, I start praying like I done lost my mind because God sent me to a dead place. I'm wrapping up here, Dr. Williams. I know my time is done, but many of our children, they need our help. And I'm not, I'm not mitigating medical help. But what I'm saying is that clinical help is good, but we need God. <laughs> Jesus sends these demons into the water because God drowns our mess in the sea of forgetfulness. And remember, they're sinners and we're sinners saved by grace. It's not ourselves. It is the gift of God, lest we should boast. All I'm saying this morning, and I can literally sit down, is that we've got to bring Jesus to your workplace. You don't have to quote scripture. You are a scripture. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. We are an epistle made by the hands of God. Demons bow down to the master. That's what this text shows us. I'm in verse 14. All this mess in our neighborhood just needs to be taken down and buried because it's creating dead places. Not only, watch this, I'm done, I'm done. Is there an immediacy of change? Not only is there an immersion of challenges, but third and finally, and I might just put the tractor in the field here, is that we see the impact of compassion. I'm done. You see the impact of compassion. In verse 2, a man with an unclean spirit comes out of a dead place. In verse 15, he's sitting and clothed in his right mind. In verse 19, Jesus has made him an evangelist and tells him to go tell everybody, verse 20, about what the Lord has done. That's my testimony. God raised me up and lifted me up out of West Oakland, California, and he grabbed me out of a dead place. And he, he showed me the impact of his compassion. Am I here this morning to tell you that God himself wants to change your life? You've got to have compassion on folks. You've got to love on folks. When God brings you to a dead place, you've got to give God the glory. Jesus changed this man's life. And when he changed this man's life, this man became an evangelism minister. He changed his life and gave him life because he is the life. And one Friday, whoo, the life was hung on a cross. They whipped him all night long. But early, woo, early, let me step back. All day Saturday, 
He was dead in a dead place all day Saturday. But early, 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 he got up with all power in his hands. And that's what happens when life comes to a dead place. God be praised. Yeah. I'm closing right here. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning. But somebody's in a dead place this morning. And you need the one who hung on the cross. Somebody this morning is in a dead place. Am I, am, I, am I in order? Okay. Is in a dead place this morning. You're in a dead relationship. You go to your ATM, it's dead. Your marriage is dead. Your relationship is dead. And you need Jesus. I dare you to come to this altar and receive the life. Somebody needs Jesus this morning. Don't play with him now. Don't play with him. Don't play with him. Somebody needs Jesus tonight. Come down boldly. Don't be scared. Come on. Somebody needs Jesus this morning. You need him right now in your relationship. You need him because heaven needs you. I double dare you to come down. Talk to your neighbor, okay? They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Heaven rejoices over one saved. Young people, come down and give your life to Christ. This is the best decision you'll make in your life. Will you come? Somebody needs Jesus. Don't be scared. Just come. Be bold. Jesus was bold enough to go into a graveyard who folks had wrote off in the prison of pain. And somebody here this morning is sitting in the pew of their pain. Yes, sir. And Jesus is already here. Will you try him? Will you try him? You can make this place your church home. Come on, come on, brother. I see you. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. I see you. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? There's still time. You need to say in your heart, I need you, Jesus. My hallelujah Yes. My hallelujah belongs to you. If you're here this morning you and you just need prayer, you, you just need prayer, just raise your hand. Bless the Lord. You, you already saved, you already have a church, oh, you. but you have a dead place. I want you to come forward. Don't miss your blessing. Don't let pride get you. Thank you for tuning in. It's our prayer that you were blessed by today's program. Expressions from St. Paul is listener supported. We would like to offer you the opportunity to partner with us to help us to continue to bring you these inspiring messages. To make a tax deductible donation by check, make your check out to the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. Mail it to 3996 14th Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95820. Or to make a secured credit card payment, visit our website at www.stpaulsac.org and click the donations icon. In 1948, there was a small local mission with just 12 members. 
The Starlight Spiritual Singers were rehearsing on Mother Rosie Roberts' porch. With her heart filled with joy, she announced, let's start a church. With that foundation, St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church grew into a beacon of faith in the Oak Park community that still holds strong to this day. Come celebrate with us 70 years of service in Sacramento with guest ministers Dr. Collier and Reverend Gaydon.